DNA profiling. Each person's DNA is unique. Everyone has a unique sequence of nitrogenous bases, and this can be used to identify people. DNA profiling is a technique used by scientists to distinguish between individuals of the same species by only using their DNA. A unique sequence of bands or bars is produced, and this sequence of bands or bars is known as a DNA profile. Every individual will have a unique DNA profile, and these DNA profiles, when compared, is referred to as being DNA profiling. Where do scientists get the DNA from? This is quite an interesting section. It links with forensics. We can find that DNA would be found within teeth, bones, hair that includes the follicle. Right? So the hair that is cut, you wouldn't get DNA in there. You get it in body fluids such as blood, saliva, and semen. So the process of DNA profiling, they take a sample of DNA and they put it into a gel plate and then they use electricity and the portions of DNA separate and it makes a unique sequence of bars or bands. The uses of DNA profiling include solving of crimes, paternity suits, determ determining who the father is, identification of dead bodies, diagnosis of inherited diseases, and developing cures for those diseases. DNA profiling can be used to solve crimes. If the profile of the evidence that is found at the crime scene, right, so the sample that's found at the crime scene, if that matches all of the bars are identical to the suspect, it will provide very strong evidence that the suspect was present at the crime scene. Right? That alone cannot be sometimes enough information to prove that a person had maybe committed the crime. If the profile does not match the suspect, then the suspect may be eliminated from the inquiry and they may look for another suspect in that case. So here's an example of DNA profiling. We had a victim and at the crime scene, they found some sample of DNA. So maybe on the handle of the knife, they found that there was some skin that was on there. It's important that they get a DNA sample of the victim and they compare it with the sample found on the crime scene. So if the skin on the handle matched that of the victim, we know that that skin also came from the victim. So it's no use looking for another suspect there. But in this case, we can see the sample at the crime scene does not match the victim. The first bar matches, but from there on, we find that there's a lot of differences there. Right, so if we look here, we find that this first bar matches exactly with suspect two, the second bar as well, the third bar in the same line, the fourth bar, the same position and the same thickness as well, the fifth bar, as well as the sixth bar, right? So generally in a question paper, you take a ruler and you'll verify that each of these are in the correct position. So in this case, scientists or the investigator would have proven that the sample found at the crime scene was from suspect number two. We also can use it in solving paternity disputes, right? Paternity refers to who is the father. Generally with maternity, there isn't a dispute because the woman knows that she gave birth to a child. So DNA profiles can be used to determine whether a particular person is the father of the child. And we know that a child receives DNA from both parents. So understanding that a person gets half of the chromosomes from each parent it gives you an idea of how we'd go through this process. So what you would do is you'd have a DNA profile from the mother and the child. Then you'd look at which bands match with the mother. So in this case, the first band of the mother doesn't match with the child. The first band of the child does not match with the mother. This third band, the second band of the mother matches with the child, right? So that's a match. 
these two of the mother do not match with the child. This bar here matches with the mother and the child. And the last bar of the mother also is an exact match with the child. Right, so after you've seen where the mother's bars match with the child, to, if you're looking for the father, the paternal link, all of the remaining bars should match with the father. Remember, this is not the same as where we're looking for a suspect from a crime scene where your DNA from the sample of your tissue of your body must be 100% the same. When you're looking at paternity, because the child inherits some from the mother, it will have a mix between both parents. Right, so we're going to look for this bar here. This has to come from the father because it hasn't come from the mother. If we look, it definitely did not come from dead one. So we can say possible dead one is out of the question. It could be, you see, this bar is common between both number two and number three. So it could possibly be number two or number three. When we look at the next bar of the child, this, that's not from the mother, is this one here. If we go across, this one matches with dead one, but we said already that the first bar didn't match him. So we already uh, canceled him from the possibilities. It matches here with dead three. And this one here also matches with possible dead three. So the paternal person that is responsible for being the parent of the child would then be dead number three. So you can see the mother was more into the older guy with, uh, who was a bit bald, but you could say he was also into her. Okay, so that can be useful for determining who the father is and sometimes maybe reuniting families. Uh, and often we know we've got issues with maintenance and child support, so this can be important in those sort of cases. Now, there are certain issues with regards to DNA profiling. One being is that it's a very expensive process. It's not something that uh, can be done at a GP or in a school laboratory or something like that. It takes a lot of sophisticated equipment and a lot of expertise, and therefore it costs many thousands of rands. And remember, you need to do a profile for the child, for the mother, and for possible fathers, right? So there's a lot of processing involved in there. So it's a very expensive process if you're doing for paternity. But even if you're looking at a crime, you have to do for the victim and for possible suspects. And with the cost being so expensive, and there's so many other needs also in the country, some people are against it because they're saying this is a very, very costly Ex, um, exercise. It's also subject to human error. So if, for example, there's a crime scene and the investigator takes samples from different people, if by mistake they label the samples incorrectly. So they take a sample from John and by mistake they write Tabiso's name on John's sample and they write John's name on Tabiso's sample, then they're going to have, even though the process would have been done properly, they're going to uh, refer to the wrong person as being guilty or innocent. There's also the risk that a person can be framed. So a criminal can take your DNA and plant it at a crime scene. So when they do the investigation, they'll find that your DNA is at the crime scene. Also, not everybody's DNA has been profiled. So if they find some skin at the crime scene and they find the profile of that skin if they don't know who a possible suspect is they won't know where that came from they need to have dna from the person who is the suspect and then match it so if they just have a profile and it's from an unknown person and there isn't a database with the profiles of everyone then it won't be of any use in that case also Profiling innocent people's DNA can be an infringement of, on their rights to privacy. I hope you found that to be an interesting lesson. We are going to divide the next part. Initially, I was thinking of covering it in one lesson, but we're going to divide it now into RNA, and then separately we'll look at protein synthesis, although those two sections are linked very closely to each other.